Hello, everyone. Welcome to our YouTube channel. This is our Wednesday Bible study with the pastor. Uh, if you weren't able to watch the sermon on Sunday, I apologize again. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, or I should say I had some technical, technical difficulties, and uh, it is up. I posted it on Monday, um, so the link to it is down in the description, or you can just go to the channel and look it up that way. Um, but it is there, so if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you should should probably go see that before we do uh, the sermon notes portion of what's going on. But uh, if you haven't, it, the the sermon notes are down in the description as well uh, here, so you can use those uh, for our study today. Uh, as we did, did last week, we are going through each of the pieces so that you can start to see how these sermon notes can not only help you with getting through the sermon and getting as much as you can out of the sermon on Sundays, but also to help facilitate a deeper faith throughout the week. Uh, it's, kind of a solo Bible study, if you will. Um, and so over the next number of weeks, we're going to focus on each individual section to kind of teach and instruct how to utilize them for the best results so that you can continue to dig deeper and deeper into your faith. So last week, we talked about the what I call the quick review, which is those two simple questions that go back directly to the fill-in-the-blank statements. Um, and as you probably noted after you've seen a couple of them so far, uh, they sound a lot like psychologist questions, like how does that make you feel, and that kind of thing. And it's all about taking those statements as premises and saying, okay, do I believe that they're true? Are, do, does it make sense? Don't just take my word for it, but really dig deep into it. Um, I'm just as human as anyone else. I make mistakes. I misinterpret things. Um, I try my best to not. I, try, I use as many sources as I can, but the more brains that are taking control of it, the better, right? Um, so today we're going to go into this next section called going deeper. In this section, you'll find two other scriptural passages. Sometimes they are part of the sermon, uh, in which case I will allude to them in the sermon. In other times, it's simply just a different scripture that has somewhat similar uh, information or teaching that goes along with that I want you to see, um, because it's always good for us to look deeper into the scriptures themselves. So today we have two numbers here. Uh, number one asks us to read from the gospel of Luke, and the second one asks us to read from the letter to the Ephesians. So we're going to start with Luke. We're going to read from 10, 25 to 37. Now, sometimes in this section, I will give you very long passages. Maybe it was the entire passage that I would have read if it not for the fact that on Sunday mornings, I'm trying not to read an entire chapter. So I may give you an entire chapter to read because it's that important. Um, and you have a little bit more time at home. But today, the Luke passage is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I talk about in my sermon. Now, in the section, I also give a little bit of background as to why I ask you to read this, and then maybe a, couple, a question or two to help you dig a little deeper into it. So uh, in this particular one, we're looking at it going, okay, the Good Samaritan is a story that shocked Jesus' hearers. And the reason it did is because the Samaritan was a hero instead of the villain, which most Jews would have said absolutely the Samaritan was 100% the villain until Jesus made him not, right? In light of the lesson about pride and humility that we got in the sermon, why do you think the story works to teach us how to love like Christ? And a lot of it has to do with understanding the fact that Jesus uses the Samaritan as a way to shock his audience into hearing something different. Uh, a lot of times teachers will use shock and awe to kind of uh, get people out of the ruts that their brains are in, right? You, you uh, Just like you would uh, shock a pool before you balanced it out, right? Jesus uses the Samaritan in this story. He could have very easily said it was a random Jew that walked down the street and saw saw a, a fellow Jewish person and went to help him. And at some level, probably would have told the same story, especially if he still gave the the two that walk the Levite and the priest who walk by and do nothing. It gives that information. 
However, Jesus picks the Samaritan for two reasons. And as I said, the first one is the big reason of the fact it just shocks the heck out of the people that are listening to him. But the second reason is that the Samaritan is someone who they've been taught is not only their enemy, but is truly their enemy, not just the one that they hate, but that the Samaritans hate them in return. Jesus uses the Samaritan and says, okay, now this Samaritan who is a 100% bona fide enemy takes pity upon the person whom should be his hated rival, hated enemy, and yet still picks him up, takes him over, takes care of him. So the question that is posed is, why do you think the story works to teach us how to love like Christ? Well, Christ comes to the world to sacrifice himself, to give salvation to those who don't know who he is, to those who hate and despise him, to those who do not follow God's will, do not follow God's creed, blaspheme, and go against God in almost every way that they can. Going back to the statement that I made in, ser in the sermon, God loved us when we were still sinners. All sin is, and we're not going to even get into them, very vast multitude of what ways you can sin. Just sin in general is your way of rebelling against God, going against God, going away from God, making yourself an enemy to God. And what does God do to his enemy? Loves him enough to send his son to die so that we might have salvation. That is the story. And the Samaritan, Good Samaritan story tells us the exact same thing. Now, let's go to Ephesians, shall we? The Ephesians passage is chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Here's what it says. It says, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But... God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up and with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might know, show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Again, Paul, this is what I, I said in the, in the sermon, it says Paul gives us the reason that we ought to be humble. I'm sure you heard what we talked about with the Samaritan there as well. This whole idea of God saving people who hated him, right? God saving people who were dead in their trespasses. He could have very easily said, I'm done with you, but he doesn't. He come, brings his son down. He brings salvation to us and says, I'm going to give you ample opportunity. I'm going to bring you mercy and grace that you do not deserve and cannot purchase on your own and could never attempt to even buy back or, 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 um, or pay back. But I'm going to give it to you anyway, because I love you that much. I want you to be saved. I want you to be with me. I want you to be in the heavenly places. I want you to be lifted up as my son is lifted. But Paul goes a step further. So the Good Samaritan teaches us that G uh, it gives us another example of how God loves us, right? That even when we are enemies, he loves us enough to pick us up off the side of the road, take us to the hotel, and take care of us, right? Paul says, okay, he does that, but let's be clear. The salvation that even when we do finally make the right choice, even when we do finally turn to God and repent and do all that right stuff, Paul says, even then, it's not you who did this. You have nothing to boast about. There is nothing for you to be prideful of. If we are truly equal in our sins, then we cannot boast in anything save one thing, and that is our love and relationship with Christ.
So what would it mean to look like, what would it mean and what would it look like to humbly boast in Christ? And the bottom line is that we've seen it, haven't we? We've seen it in church. We've seen it in other places. But there's a catch here. Because remember what I said about humility. Humility is one of those things that as soon as you say, I'm being humble, you're no longer being humble. Humble is one of those things that as soon as you think, I'm humble, you're no longer humble. So humble is about action without that thought process, right? So how do we humbly boast in Christ? Well, it goes back to evangelism, right? It goes back to the idea of how do I humbly boast? Well, I just talk about Christ. I don't necessarily have to say what he did for me, although that's a really good starting spot. I just have to tell people about him, how he lived, how he loves, how he loves me, how he loves you. And I do so in a place of saying, I am like you. I need just as much. Not I needed, because the fact is, and this is where I think a lot of people get caught with themselves. I think this is how a lot of Christians become prideful Christians. We start to think that since we've already accepted Christ into our hearts, we've already accepted the grace that he has given to us, that somehow we don't need it anymore, or that we don't need it quite as much as the sinner that lives down the street that has never been to church. But the fact is, is that we need the grace just as much as they do. Even no matter how many years you've put into the church, no matter how many years you've been in relationship with God, no matter how many times you've come up to the altar, no matter how many times you've prayed, no matter how many times you've asked for forgiveness, it doesn't matter. Today, you need the same amount of grace that you needed yesterday and the day before and the day before. And you need the same amount of grace that the person next to you does, that the person on the street does, that the person that is your enemy does. You need the same amount of grace. So we are equals. As soon as we start to think that we don't need it as much as they do, our pride is taken over. We are no longer humble. We are now boasting in the fact that we are better than they are when we're not. Lent is the time for us to truly remember and think about the fact that we are in rebellion against God. We don't want to be, but we are. As Paul said once, I do what I do not want to do. I say what I don't want to say, right? Same thing with us. We have to start with this humility that says all of us are in need of grace. All of us are in need in salvation. And the only thing we can boast in is that Jesus died on the cross so that we might have it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this time together. We give you thanks for this ability to read into your word. Father, we just pray that through this medium, through this time together, we would bring ourselves humbly before your throne so that we can go out in the world and be your humble servants to the world, just like your son was. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Next week, we will look at the last section, taking it home. And then the next couple of weeks, we will I'll highlight different pieces to help you go along through them um, as we go through the season of Lent. As I said before, if you didn't get to see the sermon, it is up. The link is down in the description. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. I look forward to either seeing you on Sunday or seeing you here on our YouTube channel. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, like button, do that, and I'll see you all next week.